Okay, so this is what we did last time. We looked at a game involving an entrance and an incumbent in a market. And the entrants had to decide whether to enter that market or not. And if they stayed out, the incumbent remained a monopolist, and the monopolist made three million in profit. All right? And if the entrant goes in, then the incumbent can decide whether to accommodate the entrants and just settle for duopoly profits, making a million each, or the incumbent can fight, in which case the incumbent makes no money at all and the entrant loses a million dollars. And we pointed out a number of things about this game. One was that when we analyzed it in a matrix form, we quickly found that there were two Nash equilibria. That Nash equilibria were in and not fight, and out and fight. But we argued that backward induction tells us that the sensible answer is in and not fight. Once the incumbent knows the entrant is in, they're not going to fight because one is bigger than zero, and the and entrant anticipating this will enter. And we talked a little bit more. We said this other equilibrium, this out-fight equilibrium, it is an equilibrium because if the entrant believes the incumbent's going to fight, then the entrant is going to stay out, and it's costless for the incumbent to, quote, fight if, they, if in fact the entrant does stay out, because they never get called upon to fight anyway. So the idea of this was that, in, that for the incumbent to, to say they're going to fight is an incredible threat. Or, that's terrible English, it's the way it's always taught in the textbooks, it's reasonably called a not credible threat. And that not credible threat is, he's not really going to fight if the entrant comes in, uh, sorry, sorry, he's not really going to fight if the entrant comes in, and therefore the entrant should come in, and in fact, the incumbent will accommodate it. So what we've shown here is if we believe this argument, then the entrant will come in, and the incumbent is going to let him in. All right? And at the end, we started talking about this in a slightly more elaborate setting. So let's just sort of remind you what that more elaborate setting is. The more elaborate setting is, suppose that there is one, uh, uh, one firm, one monopolist, and that monopolist uh, holds a monopoly in 10 different markets. So we'll have our monopolist be Ali. All right, so here's Ali. Here's our monopolist, and he owns uh, pizzeria monopolies in 10 different markets. All right, and each of these 10 different markets are separate. All right, the different towns, and in each of those 10 markets, he thinks he faced, but he knows he's going to face an entrant. And those entrants are going to come in order. So let's just talk about who those entrants are going to be. The entrants are going to be uh, this person, this person, and so on. Let's find out who they are. So your name is? Isabella. And where are you from? Miami. Miami. So look, Miami is one of the markets, and your name is? Scott. Uh, from where? Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Where? Well, Wisconsin. That's sort of where? Where? Madison. Madison. We've got two towns. Let's give you your towns now. My name is Lang. I'm from Bridgeport, Connecticut. Okay, we've got three towns. I'm from Miami, too. My, oh, it's about <laughs> Yale diversity. Well, we'll pretend you're from somewhere else. Put him in New Orleans or something. <laughs> all, right? all right? Chris from Boston. From Boston, all right? From Orange, Connecticut. Fr from Orange, Orange Connecticut, so just down the road. From St. Louis, Missouri. All right, have I done ten yet? I'm not quite at ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Southern New York. All right. Hong Kong. Hong Kong, that's way away. And Long Island. Long Island. I think I've, got, I've, probably got, I've probably got 10 markets here, okay? So Ali owns a pizza shop. He's the Monopoly pizza shop owner in each of these 10 markets. And what we're going to see is, we're going to see what happens as sequentially these entrants try to enter. And the way, the way that this game's going to work is that these, they're lined up. We know the order in which the entrants are going to come. They're going to start off. The first person who's going to have to make a decision is... It's Isabella, right? Isabella. And we're going to see how our monopolist responds. Okay, so, so, so let's, 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 let's have a look at this. All right, so Isabella, who's in which market again? Miami. In, in Miami. Okay, what are you going to do? Enter. Enter. What are you going to do? Um, I will fight. Oh, oh dear. Oh dear. So you, you, you owe me a million dollars. Okay. All right, so one, one person's down a million dollars. Let's see what happens next. Uh, I'm going to stay out. Uh, okay, so next second. Which market was this? Wisconsin, Madison. Madison stayed out. I'm going to stay out. Bridge Staying out? Bridgeport. So Bridgeport stayed out? Yes, I'll stay out. Stayed out again? Stay out. Out? Which market are we up to now? Somewhere in, uh, somewhere in Orange County, wasn't it? Where, where are we? Orange, Connecticut. Orange, Connecticut? And you're... Stay out. Stay out? I think I'll stay in. You, you think you'll come in? Okay. And which market is this? St. Louis, Missouri. St. Louis, Missouri? Oh, we've got four. So you owe me a million dollars as well. Okay, okay. A couple of people owe me a million dollars. This is a good class. We're going to have plenty of money for lunch. All right. I'm also going to fight. You're also going to fight? And you're, which market is that? Suffern, New York. Where about Suffern? Suffern, New York. Suffern, New York. Suffern, New York. Where, where are we two. on? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, Ali? Yeah. I'll fight. You fight? Okay, so you owe me a million dollars too. All right, that was eight. Nine? Out. 
out and 10 I'll stay out. stays out. Okay. Okay. Now let's just uh, notice something here. Uh, which, which was the 10th market? What, was, what, what town were you? Oh, Long Island. Whereabouts in Long Island? Oh, Huntington. Huntington. So if Huntington, Long Island, our last market had come in, suppose you'd said in, what would Ali have said? I would have not fought. Would not fought. Aha. Aha. Okay. So what happened here? What happened here? <coughs> well, we analyzed this last time as an individual market. We argued that each, each entrant should come in, just as our first entrant came in, and our uh, monopolist should not fight. Right? That's, what, that's what we have up on the board. That's what backward induction suggests. But in fact, uh, Ale fought, a whole bunch of people came in, and a whole bunch of them stayed out. Is that right? A whole bunch of them stayed out. Now, why? Why was Ale fighting these guys, and why were they staying out? Let's talk about why. Uh, what, what market were you again? Madison, Wisconsin. So, so why did Madison, Wisconsin stay out? Well, we talked about last time how he has an incentive to fight now because there's more than just our analysis up there in terms of establishing that he'll fight to keep people out. All right. So it looks like there might be some reason for fighting to keep you out. So why? Let's just talk about a bit more. So let's go to the third guy. You're, you're, which market are you again? Bridgeport. Bridgeport. So, so why did you stay out? Um, because I knew he was going to fight. You knew he was going to fight. Now, how did you know he was going to fight? Because he has... Um, he has an incentive to um, to establish that, like he established that he was going to fight for every single um, market, and so I was going to lose out. All right. So we know, we think we know, we think we know that Ale is, you know, he's this tough Italian pizzeria owner, and we think he's going to try and establish what a reputation as being a tough pizzeria owner by fighting these guys, perhaps fighting a few guys early on, in order to keep these guys out. And in fact, he successfully he had to fight the first person, but he kept out two, three, four, five, six, and this person came in, so seven and eight came in, but then nine and ten he kept out. So he kept a lot of people out of the market by fighting early on. And this argument sounds right, right? It seems to ring true, right? It's about establishing reputation. But now I want to show you that there's a worry with this argument. The worry is, this is the sequential game. Right? This is a sequential game. And like all sequential games of perfect information we've seen in the class, we should analyze this game how? Now, that wasn't loud enough. How? Backward induction. So where's the back? Where's the back of this game? Way back here. All right? Way back here. Sorry for the guys on the balcony. Way back here, we have the last market in town, which was the last market. All right? And if we look at this last market, we in fact saw that if the last market came in, Ali in fact gave in. Right? Ali gave in. Now, why did Ali give in on the last market? Let's have a look back on the board. All right? So on the board, we can see what that last market looks like. This is a, with 10 markets, this is a very complicated game. There's, you know, this would be the first market, and then there's, there's three versions of the, of the second market, depending on what Ali did in the first market, and so there's nine versions of the third market. The tree for this game is horrendous. But nevertheless, once we get to the end of the game, the 10th market, which was what? Uh, Bridgeport or something. I've forgotten where it was at now. It was just, anyway, wherever it was. Once we get to that last market, this tree pretty well describes that last market. Is that correct? Right? There, isn't, there isn't another market afterwards. There's only 10 markets. So in this last market... What do we know Ali is going to do? In this last market, if the entrant enters, Ali is going to not fight, which is exactly what Ali did do. So, so Ali, is that right? So when, when, in fact, we discussed uh, the 10th guy coming in, you chose to? I would have chosen not to fight. Would have chosen not to fight. And that's exactly what the model predicts. Right? He has no incentive to establish a reputation for the 11th market, because there isn't an 11th market. He's down at 10. Is that right? So we know that in the last market, the 10th market, Ali actually is not going to fight. Right? And therefore, the, the person who's uh, the entrant in the, 10th mar in the 10th market should know that they can safely enter and Ali won't fight them. But now we're in trouble. Why are we in trouble? Well, let's go back to the 9th market, the second to last market. So I've forgotten where it was. Wait, raise your hand, the second to last market. Okay. Second to last market is... This guy? No, this guy. You're the 10th market. So this guy who's in the Hong Kong market, all right, he should know, he should know he's the second to last market. He knows that no matter what he does, the 10th market's going to enter, and Ali's going to give in to the 10th market. Ali's going to let the 10th, market, the 10th entrant in. Is that right? So the 9th market, the 9th market actually knows that nothing Ali's going to do here is going to establish a reputation to keep the 10th guy out, 
So therefore, in fact, he should what? He should come in, right? He should come in. He should come in. And in fact, if he'd come in, Ali would have had to give in because there's no way that Ali can keep the tenth guy out. We've just argued the tenth guy is coming in by backward induction. So since we know that the tenth guy is coming in anyway, and in fact, Ali is going to accede to them, there's no point Ali trying to scare off the tenth guy. So in fact, Ali is going to say not, no fight to the ninth guy. Right? Ali's going to say no fight to the ninth guy. But now we go to the eighth guy. We've just argued that the tenth guy is coming in anyway, and Ali's going to give in to him. We've argued the ninth guy is coming in, so Ali's going to give in to this guy as well because he can't put off the tenth guy. And therefore we know that once we get to the eighth guy, once again, he can safely come in because Ali knows by backward induction he can't keep the ninth and the tenth guy out anyway, and so this guy should come in as well. And if we do this argument all the way back, what do we get? What do we get? Yeah, we, he lets everybody he in. He lets everybody in. Everybody should come in, and he should let everybody in. So we have a problem here. We have a problem. Backward induction says, even with these 10 markets, Ali, in fact, should let everybody in. Everyone should know that, so they should come in. So there's a disconnect here. There's a disconnect between what the theory is telling us, backward induction is telling us, Ali can't keep people, keep people out by threatening to fight, by establishing a reputation, and what we actually just saw that what happened, which was Ali did fight and did, keep, did keep, keep people out, and we know that other monopolists do that as well. All right. So how can we make rigorous this, this, this idea of reputation? It's not captured by what we've done so far in the class, so how can we bring back what must be true in some sense, this intuition that by fighting, Ali could keep people out, and that, and that therefore will keep people out? So to, to, to make that idea work, I want to introduce uh, a, a new idea. And the new idea is that with very small probability, let's say 1% chance, Ali is crazy. All right, so stand up a second. All right, so he looks like a normal kind of guy, but there's just 1% chance that he's really bonkers. Right, uh, if he was here today, I'd say there's 1% chance that he's actually Rahul. All right? <laughs> All right. So now, let's redo the analysis. And what do I mean by bonkers? Bonkers, I mean, with 1%, Ali is the kind of guy who likes a fight. So with 1% chance, he's actually not got these payoffs at all. He's actually got some different payoffs, which are the payoffs of somebody who, OK, he'll lose money, but he so much enjoys a fight, you know, he gets plus 10 here. All right, that's the, bo that's the bonkers guy's payoff. But, you know, only 1% chance he's this bonkers guy. All right, so now what happens? Let's just walk it through. All right, with 1% with chance, if, if there was only one market, if there's only one market, not the 10 markets, if there's only one market, and this one market was, I've forgotten your name. Isabella. It was Isabella, who was in which market? I've forgotten. Miami. In Miami. Then she doesn't really much care about the 1% chance that Ali is actually Rahul. Right? It doesn't really bother her very much. Why? Because with 99% chance, Ali is going to give way, and that's good enough odds, right? With 99% chance, She's happy to come in. So if there's only one market here, we'd be done. But with 10 markets, things are a little different. Why? Let's see why. So suppose, in fact, that uh, Isabella in Miami thinks that uh, Ali and everybody else thinks Ali is a pretty sane guy with 99% probability he's a sane guy. And Isabella enters, and everyone sees this. And to everyone's surprise, rather than doing the sane thing, which is letting, the, letting Isabella in and switching to a duopoly in Miami, with 1% chance, sorry, sorry what, what, what happens, in fact, after Isabella comes in, is that Ale fights, right? Fight. Fights, okay? So now, it's too late for Isabella, she's lost her money. But our second market is, what's your name again? Scott. Scott, which market were you? Madison. So Scott in Madison has observed what happened in Miami, and initially he thought that Ale was Ale. 99% probability, Ale was this sane, nice, calm Italian guy, all right? On the other hand, he just saw this same calm Italian guy fight, as he shouldn't have fought, couldn't have back conduction, fought the, the market, fought the entrance in Miami. So now, I forgot to again, Scott, was it? Scott thinks to himself, hmm, I'm not so sure that Ali is the same guy. Maybe I should update my beliefs in order, in the direction of thinking that Ali might actually be the, the insane guy. So maybe we're up to maybe probability a third that Ali is actually insane. All right, so he thinks, okay, if Probably a third, that's still not very much. I still risk it. He comes in, and Ali fights him again. Right? So, you know, he's, probably a third he's saying he's going to give in to me. 
He comes in, Ali fights him again. So now we're in the third market, which was which market? Bridgeport. Bridgeport. And Bridgeport's seen this horrible fight going on in Miami and this horrible fight going on in, in Madison. All right? And now he's getting pretty sure that this nice, calm-looking Ali is not nice, calm-looking Ali. He's crazy Rahul. All right? All right? I mean, there's a lot of evidence he's crazy Rahul. He's fought the last two markets and making huge losses. It must be that Ali likes to fight. So what does he do? He says, I'm going to stay out of here. Right? You know, I'm convinced that this guy may be crazy, so I'll stay out. And all the subsequent markets, they think, oh, well, you know, he fought these first two markets. That means he must be a crazy guy, or he says high probability he's a crazy guy. So they all stay out, which is exactly what happened until we got to here. And even here, when they came in, Ali acted like crazy Rahul. All right? So what made that argument possible was what? What made that argument possible was the small possibility, the 1% possibility that Ale is bonkers. But you know, how well do you know Ale? There's a 1% chance he's bonkers, right? How many of you think, how many of you think you're really sure that he's the same guy? Right? I mean, he supports Italian football teams. He's got to be pretty crazy, right? 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 So, so what happened here? The small possibility that Ale is crazy allowed him to build up a reputation that kept all these guys out. But actually, the argument is stronger than that. Let's try and push this argument harder. Suppose, in fact, that Ali is not crazy. Suppose that Ali is the sane Ali, the nice, calm Ali we all know and love. All right? But we've just argued that if Ali acts as if he's the crazy guy, then you're going to be convinced that he is the crazy guy. So by acting crazy, he might be able to convince you that he is crazy and therefore keep you out. Right? So we argued before that if there's some chance that Ali is crazy, by acting crazy early on, he's going to deter these late entrants from entering the market because they, they think they're fighting Rahul and they don't want to fight Rahul. All right? But we said these early guys, they had probability 0.99 that he was saying and 0.6 that he was saying and maybe even 0.5 he was saying here, so they thought of coming in. But now we're arguing that even if Ali is sane, even if he's a sane guy, a rational guy, he should behave as if he's crazy in order to keep these late guys out. And these early players, knowing that even the sane version of Ale is going to fight them, should also stay out. Now, notice something's happened here. They're not staying out because they think Ale is crazy. They're staying out because they know that even the sane version of Ale is going to fight them in order to seem crazy. Is that right? I would say that's a stronger argument. So now even these early guys are going to stay out of the market. All right? Now, we're almost there. What we've argued, let's just make sure we get the, the two pieces of this on the board, we've argued that if there's an epsilon chance, a very small chance, it's got a 1% chance, that Ali is crazy, then he can deter entry by fighting, i.e. seeming crazy, seeming crazy. And we argue that what really makes this argument strong is once we realize that the sane person's going to act crazy, we really know that everyone's going to act crazy and therefore we should stay out. Now that argument can't quite be right. So that's, an, that's enough of the argument I want you to have for the purpose of the exam. But let me just point out that that argument isn't quite correct. That can't quite be an equilibrium. Now, why can't that be an equilibrium? We've just argued that even the sane version of Ali, so this is a sort of slightly more subtle argument, so just pay attention a second. We've argued that even the sane version of Ali is going to act like a crazy guy. All right? All right, so everyone coming, if, if anyone came in, doesn't, you, you, he's going to act crazy anyway. So you're not going to update your belief as to whether he's crazy or sane because we know that the crazy guy is going to fight because he likes fighting and the sane guy is going to fight because he wants to seem like a crazy guy. So you're really learning nothing whether you observe him fighting or not. But now let's go back to our 10th market. Way back in our 10th market, our 10th uh, market participant whose name was Andy, Andy hasn't learned anything about, about, uh, about Ali. He hasn't learned anything because whether Ali was sane or crazy, he's going to fight. So observing what his actions early on, if that was really an equilibrium, our 10th guy wouldn't have updated his belief at all and therefore would still believe with probability 0.99 that Ali was sane, in which case our 10th guy would enter. And once again, that argument would unravel from the back. 
So what I described before can't quite be an equilibrium. It can't be just as simple as all sane guys are going to act crazy, because then you wouldn't learn the thing. So it turns out that the equilibrium in this model is actually very subtle, and it involves mixed strategies. And mixed strategies was something we did in the first half of the semester, so I don't want to go back to it now. So trust me, you can solve this out with mixed strategies. And the basic idea I gave you is right. The basic idea is sane guys are occasionally going to seem like, act like crazy guys in order to establish a reputation. And that reputation helps them down the tree. All right? So this idea, this idea that, that even when there's a chain store, people will enter. Even when Ali has 10 monopolies, people will enter. This is a famous idea. It's called the chain store paradox. And it's due to a guy called Selton who actually won the Nobel Prize. All right? This is the chain store paradox. And this idea of establishing reputation is a big idea. The idea is, once again, you might want to behave as if you're someone else in order to deter people's actions, in order to affect people's actions down the tree. All right? OK. So what have we learned here? Let's just, let's just work it out. Thank you. All right. So the first thing we learned was kind of a, a, a nerdy point, but let me make it anyway. Introducing just a very, very small probability, just a tiny probability, that Ali might be someone else. He might be a hole. He might be crazy. He must like fights. That very small probability radically changes the outcome of the game. If we were all 100% sure he was sane, we'd be tied by backward induction, and entry would follow he wouldn't be able to keep anybody out. Right? But that small probability allows us to get a very different outcome. That's the first point I want to draw out of this. And the second point I want to get out of this is really this idea of reputation. There are lots of settings in society where reputation matters. And one of them is a reputation to fight. How many of you have friends who have somewhat short fuses? You know people who have short fuses, right? right? And when, you, when you're going out on, on you know, choosing some movie to go to with these guys who have short fuses or trying to, des trying to decide who's going to order something at a restaurant or who's going to get to be which side when you're playing some game on the, some video game, right? I claim, is this true, that the people who have slightly short fuses slightly more often get their way. Is that right? right? If you have a sibling who has a short fuse, they slightly more often get their way. And that's exactly this idea. They're a little bit, they're, they're short fuse, the fact they tend to blow up and get angry at you gives them a little bit of an advantage. And notice that maybe they don't have a short fuse at all. Maybe they're just pretending to have a short fuse because they know they're going to get their way over you softies more often. Right? None of you have short fuses. You're all sane people, right? All right? So this idea should be a familiar idea to you, but it's not just an idea in the sort of trivial world of, of bargaining. Right? Notice this idea of reputation occurs all over the place. So another place it occurs, somewhat grim place it occurs, is it's in the subject of hostage negotiations. All right? In the subject of hostage negotiations, when some other country has seized some hostages from the US, or maybe some criminal organization has seized some members of your family or some members of your community uh, and is holding them hostages, there's a well-known idea, which is what? Which is that you should never negotiate with, you should never negotiate with hostage takers. Is that right? Everyone's heard that idea? You should never negotiate with, with hostage takers. You never give in just because they have hostages. Right? And why? Why? It's the same idea. Because you want to have a reputation for being somebody who doesn't give in to hostage takers in order to deter future potential hostage takers from taking hostages. Right? This has grim consequences, but sometimes it's worth bearing the cost of having your relatives come back in pieces in order to deter future relatives from being taken. All right, so that's a somewhat macabre uh, 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 version of this. Let me give you one other version. There are whole areas of the economy where reputation is crucial, where if people played according to their backward induction sane incentives, we'd have a disaster. All right? But having a reputation here isn't, a, isn't necessarily a reputation as a tough guy. It could be somebody, a reputation who ha uh, for somebody who's a nice guy. It could be that you want to have a reputation for being the sort of person who derives pleasure and utility from, quote, doing the right thing, from acting honestly. Right? So think about certain professions where the reputation of the, of the person in the profession is crucial. Doctors, for example. Right? It's crucial for a doctor that he or she has the reputation of someone who, wants, who tells the truth. Otherwise, you'd stop going to that doctor. 
right? Accountants, accounting firms rely on having a reputation for being honest and, and, and not cheating the books. When they stop having that reputation for being honest, think of Arthur Anderson after the events in Enron, they pretty quickly cease to be in business. Right? I, said that, I gave that example a couple of years ago. It was very embarrassing because it turned out Arthur Anderson was in the class. Literally, Arthur Anderson III was in the class. These things happen at Yale. All right? But nevertheless, all right? All right? Arthur Anderson relied on his reputation, the firm relied on its reputation, as an honest firm. And it was worth behaving honestly to maintain that reputation for future business. All right? So that's, I mean, reputation is a huge topic, and my guess is that the next time there's a Nobel Prize in game theory, it'll be for this idea. All right? So uh, that's my prediction there. Now, having said that, I want to spend the whole of the rest of today playing one game and analyzing one game. All right? So we're going to play this game, and for this game, I need a couple of volunteers. Uh, so I'm going to uh, pull out some volunteers. Uh, well, anyone want a volunteer? I need two volunteers for this game. How about my guy from the football team? Oh, was that a raised hand? It wasn't a raised hand. How about my guy from the football team? From, is it football team? Baseball. Baseball team. Even, well, that's actually, that may be unfair in this particular game. Uh, this particular game, that may be unfair. Maybe I'll take someone who isn't in the baseball team. I've got anyone who's in the football team. These guys. These guys in the football team. Okay, great. Great. Okay, so you two guys, right? Uh, I need you at the front. And your names are? Chevy. Shebby. Shebby? Patrick. Shebby and Patrick. So Shebby and Patrick are going to be our volunteers. Now the idea of this game is, you guys provided the volunteers. Wait, wait down here a second. You guys provided the volunteers. This game involves two uh, volunteers who you just provided, and two wet sponges. I will provide the wet sponges. So I have here uh, a couple of sponges, and in a minute I'm going to wet them. And I'll tell you what the rules are in a second. Okay, so I'm going to give one of these sponges each to, to Shebby and to Shebby and Patrick. All right, I'm then going to position Shebby and Patrick at either end of this of this central aisle, of this of this of this aisle here. All right, and the game is going to be as follows. It's important that everyone listens to the rules here because I'm going to pick two more volunteers in a moment. All right, so the game they're going to play is as follows. Each of them has one sponge. It's crucial they only have one sponge, and they're going to take turns. And when it's your turn, as long as you st have your, still have your sponge in your hand, you, have to, you face a choice. You can either throw your sponge at your opponent, all right? And if you hit your opponent, if you hit your opponent, you win the game. Or you have to take a step forward, all right? So either you throw the sponge or you take a step forward, all right? Now, there's a crucial rule here. Each player only has one sponge, and once they've thrown that sponge, they do not get the sponge back. Do right, you understand that? Once you've thrown the sponge, you do not get the sponge back. So once again, if you throw your sponge at your opponent and you hit your opponent, then you've won the game. But if you throw your sponge at your opponent and you miss, the game continues. <laughs> All right? All right? So let's make sure we understand that. If you throw your sponge and miss, the game continues. You still have to step forward. So what's your opponent going to do at that point? What's your opponent going to do? Let's make sure that our, our football players understand this. All right? All right? So, no, that wasn't meant that way. They could have been soccer players. Come on. So, all right? I didn't appreciate that very much. Sorry, I'm sorry. I didn't mean it that way. I didn't mean it that way. So if, if, uh, if your opponent, whose name is... Patrick throws and misses. What are you going to do? I will walk forward until I slam the sponge. There you see. Okay, great, great. You'll walk forward until you <laughs> politely put it on his head. Okay, everyone understand that if in fact you throw and miss, you've lost the game because the other guy can wait until he's standing right on top of you and just place the sponge gently on his head. <laughs> All right. All right. Now, for fairness' sake, it's important that these sponges are equally weighted. And I'm going to wait them. I'm going to put water in them now. And since this is you know, nothing but the best for Yale students, I'm going to provide Yale University spring water. <laughs> Who knew that Yale University had a spring? It's kind of a phrase, huh? <laughs> if it makes you feel better, you can think of this as American beer. <laughs> All right. Sorry, sorry. All right. So let's. And I'm not going to make these too heavy, partly because it makes it too easy, and partly because I don't want to get sued. All right, so I'm going to squeeze these out somewhere, away from the wires. All right. All right. 
and uh, we're going we're to get our judge here uh, to weigh them. Can you, oh, I need a mic here. So let, me just get, let me get a mic. So, okay, so I want you to hold those sponges in your hand uh -huh. and tell me if they're equally weighted. Yeah, pretty equal. Pretty yeah. equal. Okay, they're pretty equal. Everyone agrees? Mm -hmm. All right, so how is this going to work? I'm going to give the blue sponge to Shebby, is it? Yeah. And the green sponge to Patrick. Patrick. And Shebby's going to stand here. And Patrick's going to stand as far back as I can get him on camera, which I'm going to, I'm going to be told how far back I can go. Don't go too far. Okay, come, come, come back, come back, Patrick. Too ambitious. Too ambitious. Come back, 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 back. Keep up. Keep coming. Keep coming. Keep coming. Keep coming. Keep coming. Stop. No, keep going. Yeah. Okay. We're going to start here. Start quite close, actually. All right. All right. Everyone understand how we're going to play this, right? So, Chevy is player one. Patrick is player two. Chevy has to decide whether to throw or to step. I'll step. Okay, let's, let's just hold the game a second. All right, now it's Patrick's turn. Does anyone have any advice for Patrick at this point? Who, who thinks? Who thinks? Okay, wait, wait, wait. If you, think, if you think throw, raise your hand. If you think step, raise your hand. There's a lot more steps than throw. I thought the Yale football team was good this year. Okay. All right. Step. Uh, your choice, step or throw. All right. Oh, I should announce two other rules. It's kind of important. I should have said this. First, a step, a step has to be a proper step, like a yard long. And second, I think this will work in America, gentlemen never, never duck. All right? All right, no, no dodging the sponge, okay? All right, Shelby, your, uh, your turn. Uh, Let me put the mic on you, right? I don't really trust my arm. I'm going to step. All right, so he's stepping again. Let me go to Patrick, all right? I feel like I'm in the line of fire here. Patrick, what are you going to do? I'm going to throw. Patrick's going to throw. I'm really going to get out of the way then. All right? We'll see this in slow motion. Come on. Come on. Oh. Oh. oh! Continue, continue. All right. So you have to take a step forward. So Shelby's going to take a step forward, I assume. And Patrick's going to take a step forward. And Shelby's going to take a step forward. And Patrick's going to take a step forward. And you, you, oh, oh, oh. All right. <laughs> all right. Good. So a round of applause for our players. Thank you. <laughs> what happened to my... There we are. So I think we have time to do this once more, and then we're going to analyse it. So I want to get two women involved. I don't, this is too sexist otherwise. So can we, get, can we have two women in this class, please? <laughs> two volunteers. Come on. You can volunteer other people. Ah, there's a volunteer. Thank you. Great. You. And... So, Great. Okay, great. Thank you. So your name is? Jessica. Jessica. And your name is? Let me get the mic over to you. Claire Elise. Claire Elise. Claire and Jessica. All right, we'll start at the same positions. We'll use the same sponges. Uh, and I need to, need to remind you where that position was. So Jude, just give me a thumbs up when I'm in the right position. All right, good, good. All right, same rules. Uh, Claire Elise and Jessica. We'll let Jessica be player one. So Jessica, you can step or throw. What do you want to do? Going to step. Going to step, Okay. Uh, you know what would, might be a good idea? Why, Ali, why don't, you use, why don't you put the mic on, on Clara Lee so we have a mic at either end and run to and fro? That's good. All right, so Clara Lee, what are you going to do? I'm going to step. You're going to step. And Jessica, what are you going to do? I'm going to step. You're going to step. Ali and I are in danger here, never mind. I'm going to step. Any votes now? Uh, do people think that Jessica should throw? If you think she should throw, raise your hands. There's a large majority for steps, so up to you. What are you going to do? I'm going to step. Gonna step, okay. Clara Lee, any decisions? I mean, this is pretty light. I don't think it's. It's a pretty light there. sponge. It's pretty hard to throw this sponge. We just we've seen that. Step. Okay, stepping again. There's some baby steps. Um, I'm gonna throw. You're gonna throw, okay? Here we go. We'll get out of the way. Oh, okay. Continue, continue, please. Clara Lee's his turn. Your step. <laughs> Jessica has to step. Clara Lee has to step. All right, good, good. All right, so, so we've seen how the game works. Everyone understands how the game works. I want to spend the rest of today analyzing this game. All right? And before I do so, before I do so, uh, we should just talk about what this game is. Uh, let me get some new boards down here. All 
All right, so one, one quick announcement. I'm going to analyze this, and we're going to spend the rest of today analyzing this, but I'm going to this is going to be quite hard, so I'm going to provide you a handout that I'll put on the web probably tomorrow that goes over this argument. So you don't have to take detailed notes now. I want you to pay attention and see if we can follow the argument. Okay, so this game is called Duel, not surprisingly. And you may wonder, what are we doing as my colleagues are here, what are we doing throwing, you know, having a duel in class? And of course, one answer to that is it's kind of fun watching the future leaders of America throw wet sponges at each other. That's probably reason in itself. But there are other reasons. Duels are real, are, are, you know, are real games. So those of you who uh, are well-versed in Russian literature, those of you who are well-versed in Russian literature will have seen duels before, right? or at least read, read of duels. There are some famous duels in Russian literature. Anyone, anyone want to tell me some famous duels in Russian literature? Any Russian majors here? No? Nobody want to give me a shot at this? Really, nobody? This is Yale. Come on. Well, how about in War and Peace? Okay, There's a duel like this in War and Peace. All right, And in War and Peace, I think we're, and without giving away the ending, actually it's in the middle of the book and it's 800 pages long, so it isn't exactly the ending. Right? But in War and Peace, I think we're led to believe that the hero, the protagonist, uh, Pierre, uh, throws his, uh, shoots his gun. It's a gun. In War and Peace, it's a gun and not a sponge. That's a surprise. Uh, he shoots his gun too early, we're led to believe. Right? There's a famous one in Inyegin, right? in Pushkin's Ujid Inyegin. And there are lots of others, actually. So there's lots in literature. All right? There are also uh, settings which aren't exactly out of literature. So one example would be uh, a, a, in a bike race. How many of you ever watched the Tour de France? Anyone know what I mean by the Tour de France? Yeah, you put not watch it. So this is a bike race that goes around France. It takes, it takes stages. And in the Tour de France, there's a key decision. There's a game within the game. And the game within the game, I'm looking at Jake, who's a real cyclist here, but the game within the game is when do you try to break away from the pack, which is called the peloton. Right? And if you break away too early from the peloton, it turns out that you're going to get reeled in. It turns out that over the long haul, the peloton can go much faster than you. So if you break too early, they're going to catch you up. On the other hand, if you break too late then you're going to lose because there are going to be some people in the, in the peloton who are just excellent sprinters. So if you break too late, the, the sprinters are going, to are going to win the race. All right? So you have to decide when to, when to break from the peloton. All right? This is the second most, game within a ga second most important game within a game in the Tour de France. The most important game within a game is where to hide your steroids. All right? <laughs> All right. So let me give you one other example. So imagine, I don't even know a more economic example, it is meant to be an economics class. Imagine there's two firms, and these two firms are both engaged in R&D, research and development, and they're trying to develop a new product, and they're going to launch this new product onto the market. All right? But then the nature of this market is, maybe it's a network good, the nature of this market is there's only going to be one successful good out there. Right? Essentially, there's going to be one standard, let's say, of a software or a, a technological standard, and only one of them is going to survive. The problem is, you haven't perfected your product yet. If you launch your product too early, it may not work, and then consumers are never going to trust you again. But if you launch it too late, the other side will have launched already, they will have got a toehold in the market, and you're toast. All right? So that game, that game about product launch, is like Duel, except you're launching a, uh, launching a product rather than launching a sponge. Is that right? All right? Now, all of these games have a common feature. And it's a new feature for us. It's about the nature of the strategic decision. In most of the games we've looked at in the, game, in the course so far, the strategic decision has been of the form, where should I locate? How much should I do? What price should I set? Should I stand for election or not? Right? Here, the question of the strategic decision is not of the form, what should I do? It's of the form what? When? It's of the form, when am I going to launch the sponge? We know perfectly well what you're going to do. You're going to throw the sponge. The strategic issue in question is when. All right? So the issue here is when. All right. So to analyze this, I'm going to need a little bit of notation. And let me put that notation up now. All right? So in particular, I want to use the notation pi of d to be what? Let P I of D be player I's probability probability of hitting if I shoots at distance D. D. 
distance d. All right, so pi of d is the probability that I will hit if he or she shoots at distance d. All right? OK, all right, everyone happy with that? This is the only notation I'm going to use today. All right? And I'm going to make some assumptions about the nature of this probability. But they're not. Two of the assumptions are pretty innocent. So let's draw a picture. All right, so the picture's going to look like this. Here's a, a, a graph. And on the horizontal axis, I'm going to put d. This is the distance apart of the two players. And on the vertical axis, I'm going to put p, which is the probability, or pr, the probability. All right? So here they're at distance 0. And I'm going to make an assumption about what the probability of hitting is if you're at distance 0. What's the sensible assumption? What's the, what's the probability of hitting somebody with your sponge if you're zero distance away? One. Okay, I agree. So one. All right, so the first assumption I'm going to make is if they're right on top of each other, they're going to hit with probability one. And the second assumption I'm going to make is as you get further away, this probability decreases. Right? It doesn't have to look exactly like this, but something like that. All right? And that also, I think, is that, is that an okay assumption? Right, as you're further away, there's a lower probability of hitting. Now, I'm not going to assume that these two players have equal abilities. For example, I don't know, we didn't ask them, but one of our two football players might be a quarterback, and the other one might be a, li uh, might be a linebacker or a running back, and I'm assuming the quarterback is probably more accurate. Is that right? So I'm not going to assume that they're equally good. So it could be that their, their abilities look like this. This could be P1 of D. And this could be P2 of D. Everyone OK with that? All right. So shout this out. In this picture, who is, the, who is the better shot and who is the less good shot? Who's the better shot? One, right? One is the better shot because at every distance, if, if player one was the th were to throw, player one's probability of hitting is higher than player two's probability of hitting as drawn. All right? Now, I don't even need to assume this. It could well be that these probabilities cross. Right? It could be that these curves cross. So it could be that player one is better at close distances, but player two is better at, at far distances. That's fine. We'll assume it's like this today, but I'm not going to use that. Okay? That's, that's, I, could, I could do away with that. All right? As drawn, player one is the better shot. Now, I'm going to make one assumption that matters, and it's really a critical assumption. All right? I'm going to make this, this assumption that keeps the math simple for today, but we have enough math to do anyway, I'm going to assume that these abilities are known. I'm going to assume that not only do you know your own ability of hitting your opponent at any distance, I'm going to assume you also know the ability of your opponent to hit you. All right. All right. Now let's look at this a second. We've got a bit of notation on the board. Let's discuss this a second. What do we think is going to happen here? In this particular example, we have a good shot and a less good shot. Who do we think is going to shoot first? Who do we think is going to shoot first? Let's, just, let's try and cold call some people. All right, so uh, you, sir, what's your name? Uh, Frank. Frank, so who do you think is going to shoot first? The, the, the better shot or the worse shot? Um, the better shot, but also depends on who steps first as well, I think. Well, let, okay, let's, let's assume player one is going to step first. So, uh, so then play one. Play, so, play, so, so, so Frank thinks player one is going to shoot first, because player one is the better shot. Uh, who thinks, uh, let's see, so what's your name? Nick. Nick, who do you think is going to shoot first? Um, I think player two will shoot first. All right, so let's talk why. Why, why do you think player one was going to shoot first? First of all, let's do a poll. How many people think the better shot's going to shoot first? How many people think the, the worse shot's going to shoot first? How many of you are being chickens and abstaining? Quite a few, right? Right? OK, OK. All right. So why do we think the better shot might shoot first? Well, because at uh, equal distance, he has a better shot of... Because he has a better yeah. chance of hitting, all right? He has a better chance of hitting. But why do you think that the less good shot might shoot first? Um, he, know, he knows that, uh, that if P1 gets too close, he's going to win anyway. So he may as well take a shot with a lower chance uh, you know, before, before, he, before P1 is, right. go, is guaranteed to hit him. Okay. okay, so we have two arguments here. The first argument is maybe the better shot will shoot first, because after all, he has a, better, a higher chance of hitting. And the other argument says maybe the worse shot will shoot first. To what? To preempt the better shot from shooting him. All right? But now we get more complicated. 
Because after all, if you're the better shot, and you know that the worst shot may be going to try and shoot first to try and preempt you from shooting him, you might be tempted to shoot before the worst shot shoots to preempt the worst shot from preempting you from shooting him. And if you're the worst shot, maybe you're going to try and shoot first even earlier to preempt the better shot from preempting the worst shot from preempting the better shot from shooting the worst shot, and so on. All right? So it's clear, what's clear is that this game has a lot to do with preemption. Preemption's a big idea here. But I claim it's not at all obvious. It's not at all obvious who's going to shoot first, the better shot or the worst shot. Is that right? So those, those people who abstained, raise your hands again, those people who abstained before, it seems like it was a pretty sensible time to abstain. It's not obvious at all to me uh, who's going to shoot first here. All right? people, are people convinced that it's at least a, it's a hard problem? Yeah? Yes or no? People convinced? Yeah. yeah, okay, good. It's a hard problem. Okay, good. So what I want to do is, as a class, as a group, what I want us to do is solve this game. And I want to solve not just who is going to shoot first, I want to figure out exactly when they're going to shoot. All right? So we're going to do this in the next uh, half hour. And we're going to do it as a class. Right? So you're going to do it. So we're going to nail this problem, basically. All right? And we're going to do it using two kinds of arguments. One kind of argument is an argument we learned the very first day of the class. And that's a dominance argument. And the second kind of argument is an argument we've been using a little bit recently. And what kind of argument is that? What is it? Backward induction. So we're going to use dominance arguments and backward induction. And we're going to figure out not just whether the better shot or the worst shot's going to shoot, but exactly who's going to shoot when. All right. Let's keep our picture handy. Get rid of, well, I can get this down, I guess. And we'll, can we still see the picture? Yeah. All right, let's, let's proceed with this argument. All right, so to do this argument, I first of all want to establish a couple of facts. All right, my page of my notes. I want to establish two facts. And we'll call the first fact, fact A. All right. Let's go back to our two players we had before. In fact, maybe it would be helpful to have our play. Can I use our, two play our first two players as props? Can I have you guys on stage? While they're coming up? All right. Sorry, guys. I'm exploiting you a bit today. All right. Hope you both signed your legal release forms. All right. All right. Why don't you guys sit here a second so I can use you as props? So imagine, imagine that these two guys still have their sponges. All right. Let's actually uh, set this up. So, so I suppose that Shebby's, Shebby? Still, yeah. she, Shebby says a sponge, and Patrick still has his sponge. All right, and suppose it's Shebby's turn. All right, and suppose that Shebby is trying to decide whether he should throw his sponge or not. Whether he should throw his sponge or not. Can I have that other mic? Oh, here, here we go. Let me, let me give you a mic each so you have them for future reference. All right, so, she, so Shebby is trying to decide whether to throw his sponge or not. And suppose that Shebby knows, suppose that Shebby knows that Patrick is not going to shoot, is not going to shoot next turn when it's his turn. Right, so Chevy's trying to decide whether to shoot, and he knows that Patrick is not going to shoot next turn when it's his turn. What should Chevy do? Chevy, what should you do? Take a step. Take a step. So he says take a step. That's right. Why should he take a step? What's the argument why he should take a step? Well, let's find out. What's the argument? Because I'll get another, I'll just be one step closer and I'll have another chance to decide. Shout anyway. it out so you can be heard. Yes, that's right. That's right. Sh shout out so you can be heard. I'll, I'll be one step closer, and I'll be able to make the same choice next time anyway. Good, good. Hold, hold the mic up, up to you. You're a rock star now, okay? All right, good. All right? All right. All right. He, he, he's correctly saying he should wait. Why should he wait? Because he's going to be closer next time. He's going to be closer next time. So the first fact is, assuming no one has thrown yet, assuming no one has thrown... If player I knows at, say, distance D that J will not, will not shoot, let me call it tomorrow, and tomorrow he'll be closer, he'll be at distance D minus 1, 
then Shelby correctly says, I should not shoot today. And again, recall the argument. The argument is you'll get a better shot, a closer shot, the day after tomorrow. All right? All right? Now let's turn things around. Suppose, conversely, once again, we're, we're, we're picking on Shebby a second. So Shebby has his sponge, no one has thrown yet. And suppose Shebby knows, suppose Shebby knows that Patrick is going to throw tomorrow. Right? Suppose he knows that Patrick is going to throw tomorrow. Now what should Shebby do? Now what should Shebby do? Now that's a harder decision. What should Shebby do? So, right, he, he knows Patrick's going to shoot tomorrow. What should he do? Should he shoot or what? what, what what's the answer this time? What do you reckon? It depends. It depends. I think it's, that's the right answer. Right? It depends. Good. So the question is, someone else, I don't, want to pick, I, don't, I don't want to pick entirely on these guys. So what does it depend on? Right? It's, it's right that it depends. What does it depend on? Yeah. If the other guy's chance is greater than or less than 50% of getting you. All right. So it might depend on the other ch chances being being less than, greater than less than 50%. It certainly depends on the other guy's ability and on my ability. Everyone clear on that? But how exactly, everyone agree that whether I should shoot now, if I know the other guy is going to shoot tomorrow, depends on our abilities. But how exactly does it depend on our abilities? Yeah, go ahead. Um, it depends on if... Shout out. Uh, it depends on if your probability to hit is greater than his probability to miss. Good, good. Your name is? Osman. Osman. So Osman is saying... Let's be careful here. It depends on whether my probability of hitting, if I throw now, is bigger than his probability of missing tomorrow. Now, why is that the right comparison? That's the right comparison because if I throw now, my probability of winning the game is the probability that I hit my opponent. And if I wait and take a step, then my probability of winning the game is the probability that he misses me tomorrow. Right? So I have to compare winning probabilities with winning probabilities. I have to compare apples with apples, not apples with oranges. Everyone see that? OK, so let's put that up. Right? So the same assumption, assuming no one has thrown, if I knows at D that J will shoot, will shoot tomorrow at D minus 1, then I should shoot if, need a gap here, if I's probability of hitting at D, and let me leave a gap here, is bigger than, let's make it bigger than or equal to, it doesn't really matter about the equal case, is greater than or equal to J's probability of missing tomorrow. Right? Because this is the probability of probability that you'll win if you throw, and this is the probability that you'll win if you wait. Okay? So let's put in what those things are. So the probability that I will hit at distance D, that's not that hard. That's P I D. Everyone happy with that? What's the, what's the probability that J will miss tomorrow if J throws? What's the probability that J will miss? Somebody? Shout it out. Yep, shout it. Right, one, let's be careful. So it's one minus PJ, but what distance will they be at? D minus one. So it's one minus PJ, D minus one. All right? All right, so this is the key rule. If Shebby knows, if Shebby knows that Patrick's going to shoot tomorrow, then Shebby should shoot if his probability of hitting, PID, is bigger than Patrick's probability of missing, 1 minus, P, uh, one minus uh, P Patrick, D minus 1. All right? Now I want to do one piece of math. This is the only math in this proof. All right? So everyone who's math-phobic, which I know there's a lot of you, can you just hold on to your seats? Don't panic. A little bit of math coming, okay? This is the math. I want to add, I want to add PJD minus 1 
to both sides of this inequality. All right, that's it, okay? All right, so that, what, what's that tell me? If I add p j d minus 1 to this side, I get plus p j d minus 1. Everyone happy with that? And on the other side, if I add p j d minus 1, I get just 1. Everyone happy with that? All right, so here's our rule. Our rule is, if, if, let's flip it around, if Patrick hasn't thrown yet and thinks that Shebby is going to shoot tomorrow, then it, Patrick should shoot now if his probability of hitting now plus uh, Shebby's probability of hitting tomorrow is bigger than one. All right, let's call this star. Let's call this star. And let's put this stuff up somewhere where we can use it for future reference. All right. Sorry, guys, I'm, I'm, I'll use you again in a minute. I know, I know you're feeling uh, self-conscious up there. Believe me, I'm self-conscious up here too. So. All right, okay, so let's look at that star inequality up there. Now, way out here, is that star inequality met or not met? It's not met, it's not met, right? Because way out here, these two probabilities are small, so the sum is less than one. And in here, is, this pro is, the, is the star inequality met or not met? Met, uh, I mean, let me pick on you guys. So, Patrick, is it met or not met in here? Sh Shouting to your microphone? It's met. It's met. Thank you. Okay. All right. So, in here, in here, the inequality is, is met. The sum is bigger than one. And out here, it's less than one. If we put in all the steps here, here they are getting closer and closer together. Here's the steps. They get closer and closer together. Right. We put these steps in. There's going to be some step where, for the first time, the star inequality is met. So notice that they start out here, they get closer and closer. It's not met, 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 and suddenly it's going to be met. Maybe around here. Let's just try and figure it out. Maybe it's, maybe it's here. Right, so this might be the first time that this star inequality is met. Let's call it D star. Right, everyone understand what D star is? At, at, every distance to the, at every one of these steps to the right of D star, when we take the sum of the probability at id plus pjd minus 1, we get something less than 1. But to the left of d star, or closer in than d star, the game is proceeding this way, it's proceeding right to left, yeah, they're getting closer and closer. To the left of d star, uh, it, uh, the, the, the sum of those probabilities is bigger than 1. Let's right, so say it again. d star is the first step at which the sum of those two probabilities exceeds 1. Right? Everyone OK about what d star is? Anyone want to ask me a question? OK? People, people should feel free to ask questions on this. I want to make sure I'm, everyone's following. Is everyone following so far? Yeah? I need to see all your eyes. You don't look like you're stuck in the headlamps like you were on Monday. All right, we're better off than we were on Monday. Good, okay. Okay, so here's our picture. Uh, and I actually want a bit more space. Mm, I'm not going to have much more space. All right. All right, so now I'm going to tell you the solution. The solution to this game is this. I claim that the first shot should occur at D star. All right, so that's my claim. The first shot should occur at D star. No one should shoot until you get to D star, and whoever's turn it is, whether it's Shebby's turn or Patrick's turn at D star, that person should shoot. That's my claim, and that's what we're going to prove. Okay, everyone understand the claim? It says, nobody shoots, nobody shoots, nobody shoots, nobody shoots, nobody shoots, nobody shoots, shoot. Okay? Okay? All right, let's prove it. Everyone ready to prove it? Yeah? People to be awake. If your neighbor's not awake, nudge them hard. All right, good. All right, let's start this analysis way out here. Well, let's start way out here, miles apart. All right, these guys are miles apart. Now I want to use them as props. So I've got these guys. Let's put them, stay, stay where you are, Patrick, but stand up. And they'll be over here somewhere, but just where that black line is. All right, so maybe they're even further than this. They're really far apart. All right, and here they are miles away. And let's say it's Shebby's turn. It's Shebby's turn. He's way out here. That's right, the first step of the game. Imagine it's even further, because it was even further. All right? And let's think through what should be going on in Shebby's head. Right? There are two possible things going on. 
he's going to think about what Patrick's going to do. So this is Shebby's turn. Here he is. Right? And he should think, tomorrow it's going to be Patrick's turn. All right? And there's two possibilities. One possibility is that Patrick is not going to shoot tomorrow. All right? And if, if we think he, that Patrick is not going to shoot tomorrow, which fact should Shebby use? Should he use fact A or fact B? Shebby, which fact should he use? Fact A. Fact A. Okay, so using fact A, he should not shoot. All right? Alternatively, he could think that Patrick's going to shoot tomorrow. Is that right? He could think Patrick's going to shoot tomorrow. If he thinks Patrick's going to shoot tomorrow, which fact should he use? B. B. He should use fact B, in which case he has to look at this inequality up here. Let's look at this inequality and say, I'll shoot if my probability of hitting now plus his probability of hitting tomorrow is bigger than 1. Well, let's have a look. This is... This is Patrick's probability of hitting today. And this is Chevy's probability of uh, sorry, this is sorry, this is Pat this is Chevy's probability of hitting today, and this is Patrick's probability of hitting tomorrow. And are, is the sum of them bigger than one or not? Is it bigger than one or not? It's not bigger than one. So what should Chevy do? He should step, right? He should step. Alright? So he'd, he'd step. Alright, he'd step. Alright, now it's Patrick's turn. All right? And once again, imagine this distance is still pretty large. And pa there's two things Patrick could think. Patrick could think that Shebby's, going to, uh, going, uh, that Shebby's not going to shoot tomorrow. All right? So here's Patrick. He's looking forward to Shebby tomorrow. And he could think that, Patrick's, uh, he could think that Shebby's not going to shoot tomorrow. If he thinks Shebby's not going to shoot tomorrow, which fact should he use? A. Should he use fact A, OK? And if he's using fact A, he should not shoot. Right? Alternatively, he could think that Chevy is going to shoot tomorrow, in which case he uses fact B. B. All right? And what does he do? He adds up his probability, Patrick's probability of, of hitting today, plus Chevy's prob probability of hitting tomorrow. He asks, is that pro uh, sum bigger than 1? And he concludes, he concludes, he concludes no. So we have no shot here and no shot here. And notice that both of those arguments were dominance arguments. In each case, whether Shebby thought that Patrick was going to shoot tomorrow or not, in either case, he concluded he should not shoot today. Right? And when Patrick's turn, whether Patrick thought that Shebby was going to shoot tomorrow or not, in either case, he concluded he should not shoot today. So he takes a step forward. All right? And this argument continues. It'll be Shebby's turn next. And once again, he'll look at these, he'll look at these two Possibilities. If he thinks Patrick's not shooting tomorrow, he wants to step. If he thinks Patrick is going to shoot tomorrow, he's again going to want to step the way it's drawn. And once again, we'll conclude step. All right? And we'll go on doing this argument, and each, everyone see that in each case, this dominance argument will apply. It won't matter whether I think you should shoot tomorrow or not. In either case, it'll turn out that I should step forward, whether fact A applies or whether fact B applies. All right? So we'll go on, shoot, go on going forward, and we'll have no shot, no shot, no shot, no shot, no shot. And we'll arrive at D star. Uh, OK, uh, two, two, one, two, one, two, two, one, two, one, two, one. All right, so uh, it turns out that D star is going to be Chevy's turn again. All right, and at D star, we try exactly the same reasoning. At D star, he says, if I think Patrick is not going to shoot tomorrow, what should I do? What should I do if I think Patrick's not going to shoot tomorrow? Not shoot. Not shoot. But now something different occurs. Now he says, if I think Patrick is going to shoot tomorrow, if I think Patrick is going to shoot tomorrow, then when I look at my inequality up there, my star inequality, and add up my probability of hitting today, which is this line here, plus Patrick's probability of hitting tomorrow, which is this line here, suddenly he finds it is bigger than 1. Right? He finds it is bigger than 1. So now, if Shebby thinks that Patrick is going to shoot tomorrow, what should Chevy do? I should shoot. He should shoot. All right, so up until this point, a dominance argument has told us no one should shoot. But suddenly, we have a dilemma. The dilemma is, if Chevy thinks Patrick's not shooting, he should step. And if Chevy thinks Patrick is shooting, he should shoot. Everyone with me so far? So what have we shown so far? We've shown that no one should shoot until D star, but we're stuck because we don't know what to do at D star, because we don't know what Chevy should believe at D star. We don't know whether Chevy should believe that Patrick's going to shoot, or whether Chevy should believe that Patrick's not going to shoot. 
So how do we figure out what Shebi should believe Patrick's going to do? What? Wait, 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 wait. Wake up the guy in orange there. Right? The, the, the guy with the ginger hair, that's right. Yeah, yeah. What, what's the answer to that question? Good. The answer to the question is backward induction, right? Good. <laughs> Round of applause for remembering the answer. All right, good, good. Backward induction is the answer to all questions, especially when you're asleep, right? OK, so, so now we're going to use backward induction. But where is backward induction start here? Backward induction starts at the back of the game. And what's the back of the game here? The back of the game is where? It's when these two guys, neither of them have thrown their sponge, and they've reached here. All right, so come in, come in a second. Step, 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 step. All right, and let's assume it's Patrick's turn, and they're absurdly close. They're uncomfortably close. <laughs> All right, if they had longer noses, they'd be touching, right? They're at distant zero. They're at distant zero. And at distant zero, at d equals zero, let's suppose it's Patrick's turn, right? So at d equals zero, no one is shot. It's Patrick's turn. He's got the sponge. What should Patrick do? Shout it out, Patrick. Shoot. You should shoot. Patrick should shoot, right? At d equals zero, say it's two's turn. And the answer is he should shoot because the probability of hitting at distance zero is one. Is one. All right? Let's just move you to the side of it so that people can see the board. So can we, can I, can I, just, I, I know it's an awkward dance, but here you are, right? right stop, stop, stop there. That's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. Okay. So at distance zero, at distance zero, they should certainly shoot. All right? So now let's go back a step in the backward induction. So we're at distance one, so just take a step back. All right, so take a step back. It's Shebby's turn at distance one. So it's Shebby's turn. And what does Shebby know? What does Shebby know at distance one? Shebby, what do you know? Shout it out. Uh, that Patrick will uh, shoot next turn. Right, so now Shebby knows that Patrick's going to shoot tomorrow. So which fact should <sighs> Shebby use in deciding whether he should shoot today? B. B. You should use fact B. And that tells us, right, so, so one knows that two will shoot tomorrow. So by B, by B, one should shoot if his probability of hitting at distance one plus Patrick's probability of hitting at distance zero if that is bigger than one. Well, is it bigger than one? All right, let's have a look. We, we had a shot in here already. We put a shot in here, and we're looking at distance one. All right, and so we're looking at this distance here plus this distance here. And is it bigger than one? Yeah, it's bigger than one. Here's a bit more math I lied to you before. One plus something is bigger than one, okay? All right? All right, so this is, this is bigger than one, so shoot. Let's put it on our chart, a shoot. All right, now let's go back a step. Sorry, I have to have Chevy go all the going backwards. All right, now we're at distance what? We're at distance two. We're at d equals two, and it's Patrick's turn, two's turn. And what does Patrick know? Shout it out, Patrick. I know that Chevy's going to shoot next turn. Right, Chevy. Patrick knows that Chevy's going to shoot next turn, so Patrick, therefore, should use which fact? Fact B. Fact B. And fact B tells him that, uh, that he should... Sh let's put this in. So two knows that one will shoot tomorrow, so by B, it's all the same thing, we know that two should shoot if... P2 of 2 plus P1 of 1 is bigger than 1. But if we look at it on the board, here we are, it's 2's turn. He's looking at this distance plus this distance. And is it bigger than 1? It is bigger than 1, so he should shoot. shoot. And we can go on doing this argument backwards. We'll find that Shebi should shoot here because this plus this is bigger than 1. And we'll know that here, Patrick, once again, will know that Chevy's going to shoot tomorrow, so he should use fact B. So he should shoot, provided this plus this is bigger than 1, but it is. And now we're back at D star. And the question we had at D star, the question we'd left hanging at B star was what? At D star, we knew already that Chevy would not shoot 
if he thought Patrick was not going to shoot tomorrow, but he should shoot if he thinks Patrick is going to shoot tomorrow. But what does Chubby know at D-Star? I know Patrick's going to shoot. He knows Patrick's going to shoot, so he should shoot. Is that right? He knows Patrick's going to shoot by backward induction, so he should shoot. So we just solved this. What do we actually show? We showed... Have seats, gentlemen. Sorry, sorry to keep you up here. Right? We know that prior to D-star, no one will shoot, so not shoot. And we know that at D-star, and in fact at any point further on, we should shoot. That's horrible writing, but it says shoot. All right? So we've shown, we've shown more than we claimed. We claimed that the first shot should occur at D-star, but we've actually shown more than that. We've shown that even if you went beyond D-star, and if, if somebody had forgotten to shoot at D-star, at least you should shoot now. And give me like two more minutes, to, to, or three more minutes to finish up this, finish this up, because we're at a high point now, okay? All right, everyone okay to wait a couple of minutes? Okay, so, so what do we prove here? We proved that the first shot occurs at D-star, whoever's turn it is at D-star, whoever's turn it is at D-star. It wasn't that the best guy, the better shot should shoot first, or the worst shot should shoot first, it turned out that given their abilities, there was a critical distance at which they should shoot. Right? If you go back to the 18th century military strategy, you should shoot when you see the whites of their eyes, which is at D-star. <laughs> All, right? All right? But we learned something else on the way. I claim we learned that if you're patient and you go through things carefully, that the arguments we've learned in the course so far, dominance arguments, and backward induction arguments can solve out a really quite hard problem. This was hard, right? It would have been useful for the guy in War and Peace or in Yegin or the guys cycling in the Tour de France or you guys for your sponges to know this, and we can solve this exactly using backward induction. And everyone in the room can do it. Let me just push the argument a tiny bit further. One thing we've always asked in this class is, okay, that's fine if everyone knows what's going on in the game. Here we have our smart uh, Yale football players, and they know how to play this game, so they're going to shoot at the right time. But what happens if instead of playing another smart Yale football player, they're playing some uneducated, probably simple-minded football player from, say, Harvard? All right. Now, that changes things a bit, doesn't it? Because we know that the Yale football player is sophisticated, has taken my class, and knows that he should shoot at D-star. But the Harvard guy doesn't know anything anymore, right? So they're, they're stuck. So if you're the Yale guy playing the Harvard guy, what, how does that change your decision? Should you shoot earlier than D-star when you're playing against the Harvard guy, or later than D-star when you're playing against the Harvard guy? Let's try our Yale guys and see what they think. What do you think, shall we? Microphone up. Um, definitely not earlier. Definitely not earlier. That's the key thing, right? Now, why? Why definitely not earlier? Because uh, you, if you miss, the other person has a probability of one. All right. You have a higher chance of missing. Before all, you all right. All right. So I claim. So I, I claim it's definitely. Uh, Chev is right. It's good because I'm just playing the Yale football players are sophisticated. Chev is right that even if you're playing against a Harvard guy, you shouldn't shoot before D-star because it was a dominant strategy not to shoot before D-star. Right? It doesn't matter whether you think the Harvard guy is going to be dumb enough to shoot early or not. If he is dumb enough to shoot early, so much the better. You should wait till D-star. Notice that argument doesn't depend on you playing against somebody who's sophisticated or someone who's less sophisticated, like a Harvard football player, or somebody who's basically... Um, you know, a, a chair, like a Harvard football player, <laughs> right? 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 You shouldn't shoot before D-star because it's a dominant strategy not to shoot before D-star. Now, you might want to wait a little to see if they're not going to shoot early, to see if they're not going to shoot, but you certainly shouldn't shoot early. And let me finish with one other thing. Every time when we play this game in class, whether it's here or up in SOM, people shoot too early. People shoot too early. They miss. Right? You can do a kind of econometrics on this. You could figure out that on average, on average abilities, I'm sometimes getting the better shots, sometimes getting the worse shots. On average, I should see people hitting about half of the time right? and over a large sample. Right? But here, I, I tend to see people miss, as we did today, almost all the time. Why do we see so many misses? Why do we see so many misses? So one problem may be that people are just overconfident. They're overconfident on their ability to throw. Right? And there's a, lot, there's a large literature in economics about how people tend to be overconfident. 
But there's another possible explanation, and let me just push it past you as the last thing for today. I think Americans, I think this doesn't go for the Brits, Americans have what I call a proactive bias. You guys are brought up since you're in kindergarten, maybe before, and you're told you have to be proactive. You have to make the world come to you, right? right? And my evidence for this is based on sophisticated empirical work watching Sports Center. So on Sports Center, when they, when, they, uh, when they interview these sweaty athletes after the game, the sweaty athletes say, it's great, I now control my own destiny. Right? Well, I'm a Brit. I think controlling my own destiny sounds kind of scary to me. It doesn't like a good thing at all. all right? In fact, if I wanted to control... Hang on, we'll be finished in a minute. If I wanted to control my own destiny, I wouldn't have got married. Right? Right? <laughs> right? But, no, 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 no that's going to be edited off the film. But, but, the point I want to make is this. Every time I play this game and I ask people why they shoot early, I hear the same thing, and it's evident to this proactive bias. People say, well, at least I went down swinging. <laughs> and the problem is, in life, the, the, the aim in life is not to go down swinging, it's not to go down. <laughs> All right? So one lesson to get from this, from this lecture is, sometimes waiting is a good strategy. All right, well, we'll come back to it on Monday.